Recently, we attended the Collins Cup hosted by the PTO. It was an amazing race to watch and for us guys to be in amongst all that action. But what made it even more special was having some of the true legends of our sport there. So naturally, I had to ask them some questions. What is your favorite bike from your triathlon career? Over all the years, which was the best one that you rode? Well, the best one I rode was the one that I had my final year when I did Ironman in 1995. It was kind of the, the very beginning real version of what has become everybody's bike now. You know, the aero tubing and really light and just, but you can see in the setup that we just didn't have the same positioning of the seat and you know, just the whole cockpit was different. It was way better than what we had had, but it was nothing like they have now. And definitely it was a lot heavier than what the athletes have now. And, but it was, at the time, it, was, it felt like a rocket ship really? compared to what I had ever been on before. And is there anything, I mean, you, I, particularly during your era, there, was, there were some big changes and radical changes in the designs. Was there anything odd that you did? You look back and like, what was I doing? Or anything interesting that you tried out during the time? Well, you know, I mean, my career spanned every, every cycling trend that you saw. Like when I started out, it was a road bike with handlebars, there's no aero bars. My, I had toe clips on my, uh, you know, on my pedals. The shoes I had to tie it was a pair of Dweegees. <laughs> You know, and so then it went from that to then you have clip-on pedals and you've got aero bars that, that you clip on and then finally, you know, just this whole whole thing. Probably the, the wackiest thing I did though was I heard that uh, there was this one contraption where you would put, attach a, like a, a, a strap to your handlebar and then it was a belt that went around your waist so that you could kind of push against it and generate power, right? And it kind of worked if you were going up hills, but then the only problem was that when you are on flat and you scoot forward, all of a sudden there's no tension and this thing is dangling. And anyway, so I kind of tried it in training and then I had it on the race in Kona and halfway through the race, I go, this thing is a piece up. <laughs> Tore it off and threw it on the side of the road. Oh, that's a, I didn't know that. And I'm gonna have to search for this now. Okay. Maybe there's a video in it, future on GTN. Geez, probably the Trek 2300. Oh, that was a nice bike. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. And it was bike. one of my first, you know, ones that I did some good things on. And yeah. Um, yeah. And I remember Mike Pig, I think, was on the same bike, and it wasn't as fancy as a lot of our competitors, but man, it rode we well. both managed to make that thing go. Any uh, weird and wacky things that you rode or tried? I mean, we had things like smaller front wheels during your um, year or so. Well, I had um, the J disc, which wasn't wacky at all. It was awesome. Like I think it was, you know, people used to make fun a little bit because of the, you know, it was um, not completely durable. Like one time at a homestay, I had um, in St. Croix, they had pet turtles in the living room and a turtle put um, their paw through my disc wheel. <laughs> I had to like tape it up for the race. Um, I had uh, something called Sark bars, which were one of the first um, aero bars. Okay. It was just a friend of mine that was making them in his garage. That was my first aero bar. Nice. Um, what other crazy things? I tried the seat shifter, I remember. Oh, um, yeah. The thing where I just pushed a lever and when you went down on your bars, it would move you forward a little bit. Didn't they have a tendency to break? Uh, it just... Um, yeah, I, I didn't like the way it changed. Your, your height didn't quite change right. the way it should. So okay. yeah, that was my problem with it. So so many good things that I think they should bring back now with the new technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah very cool. Really, it was the, the Kuota Calibur. And uh, you know, there's a little story behind. They had no bike. I, I, just, I just saw the drawing on a paper. Okay. from an Italian company and they said oh, that will be the best bike on the market and uh, I was I was not happy with my other bike brand of France uh, brand from France uh, they also make pedals uh, and I looked at the drawing and I said that's a, that's a good looking bike and so they they made a bike for me in 2004 for the Ironman Hawaii and I won and the Calibur was for me it was of course I won but it was just an not a fancy bike, it was just an aero and a bike who fits me. And uh, yes, the quarter caliber. 
So I have the cheetah that I was riding all my years uh, with all my victories in Hawaii. And it was a very special bike, and it still is because there are only 140 handmade bikes. I do ride another bike these days, but back then it was the cheetah all the time. When I was racing my favorite bike, my first time trial bike was uh, the BMC one. Yeah. Uh, where Tyler Hem Hamilton won the Olympics. So that was my favorite bike. How about road bike beforehand? Because obviously you also did a bit of short course racing as well. Well, the same, the BMC, as a Swiss, I, I was on BMC all my life. Wow. So, so that, that was my first, uh, first uh, bike. Yeah, I loved it. Oh, I, I have a Surly ECR. Oh, cool. Which is not a, yeah, <laughs> not a bike I would obviously race with, no. but it's, uh, it's a tribute to a military cargo bike. My granddad uh, fought in both world wars and would have ridden something like that. So hands down, that's my, my favorite bike. Now, bikes that I raced, I raced a Cervelo. Yeah. And uh, that was something else. I mean, it, it's transcended generations, hasn't it? It, it really has, It set yeah. a standard and then it just kept going with it. Um, the bikes these days, it's incredible to see all the little proprietary parts. And, well, it's fun. I'm, I'm such a tri geek for it. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, actually, the first bike was a $75 police auction bike that uh, I bought to do the Ironman in 1980 and had uh, solid rubber tires on it because I had no <laughs> idea that the, I had no idea how to change a flat. Had a fuzzy raccoon seat cover, had the a pannier sleeping bag and tent on the back because I thought you swam 2.4, rode 56, camped out, rode back the next day and ran the marathon. You're kind of ahead of your time. Well, I was totally ahead of my time. Foam grips uh, and the handlebars and reflectors and kickstand and all the cool stuff. Um, but the bike I've been riding for the last 10 years, a specialized shiv, which I love, and the main reason I love it is it's named after a prison instrument, a <laughs> shiv, you know? I think that's pretty cool. It means it's, it's dangerous. And the only reason I would get another bike is if I get a shank, because it's another prison instrument. When, they, <laughs> when Specialized comes out with a shank, that'll be my next bike. Awesome. Uh, what's your most memorable moment of triathlon for yourself, from training, racing, traveling? Oh my God. Uh, you know, actually one of my favorites, I was doing a race in, in Switzerland called Power Man, and I was doing the, the shorter distance race, and I was uh, passing this young man on the uphills and he was passing me in the downhills. And then we came off the bike together and ended up running together. He didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of, of Swiss. And we became really close friends. That's was, really yeah, cool. Yeah, it was just one of those things. That was a really special moment. And then another one that meant a lot to me in 1981, I met another uh, a kid who he became the youngest guy to finish the Ironman. His name was Robin Tane. And he was a um, he was he was 14 years old, and I met him and his buddies and his father and mother that week of the race. And turned out on race day, we came off the bike, and um, he caught me in the in the marathon. And we ran the last part of the marathon together. And as you're getting towards the end of the marathon, you start thinking, well, we're not going to come across the line together. We're not doing that. So I'm running with a 14 year old kid. If I out sprint him, I out sprinted a 14 year old. <laughs> And if I don't out-sprint him, I've lost to a 14-year-old. So as I'm trying to figure out what the hell to do, he is 100 yards ahead of me in 12 seconds. And I didn't have anything to, to think about because he kicked my ass. So I lost to a 14-year-old. So that was, uh, that was a great moment. So a lot of the, to me, the great moments are you meet new people and you get new friends because that, that's what we miss during the time of COVID is just that whole social aspect. Yeah, definitely. My last race in Hawaii, uh, walking the last 20k with Tim the Boom. <laughs> Memorable in a good way or a bad way? Uh, it was a, you know, uh, Hawaii gave us everything, but took also a lot of us. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we we talked to each other and we said we will never come back. And we crossed the finish line together and we never came back. Yeah, and, and quite a person to cross the line with as well. Yeah, yeah so four Hawaii together. winners crossing the line and yeah, yeah we never came back. and. Uh, it was a yeah, very special moment. Some of the real great memories are things that I did w when I was traveling internationally. Like my first trip to Nice was like, I was like a kid in a candy shop. I'd never been to Europe and it's like, I'm in Europe and wow, look at this. You know, the buildings are old and you know, the people are speaking French and <laughs> the food is so much different. And I loved it, you know, yeah. and I could see that a lot of the guys that I was traveling with from America, they, they were trying to, hold on to some feeling of having it be like it is back home. And I'm like, 
why would you want France to feel like the United States? You, you come to France, like just absorb it, you know? And so for me, it was, I think that set the stage for um, always seeming to race really well internationally because I just love to be in a different culture and different environment and race athletes who had different strengths than a lot of the Americans. You know, like the Europeans, they were obviously were super strong on the bike. That showed me what was possible cycling. Go to Australia, they were some of the best swimmers, so they showed me what was possible swimming. And, you know, every country had great runners, so that was, you know, you, you just kind of learn. But So I just love that mix of being in an environment that is, you know, you get up in the morning and you're, you're in a different country. There's this trigger that there's something special going on here. This is not a training day. Mm. And, and Hawaii is kind of like that in a sense. Like it is a very different environment and culture than on the mainland United States. And so, you know, you get up race morning for Ironman, you know you're in a, a place that's different, it's special, it's something unique. You have this one day to do something amazing and you want to make the most of it. That's almost gives me a goosebumps and all that. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can't pick just one. It's too hard. Like, there's just uh, so many. All right, so probably, um, like, looking backwards with perspective, um, it was really cool to be at the first World Championships in Avignon just because now you look back and it was just such a big moment for the sport. And I, we were sort of aware of it at the time, and I remember being in a room after the race with you know all the people that had made it happen and some of the you know top athletes that were there and the race had gone well and everybody was just so happy and like congratulatory and yeah. it just felt like this big community had pulled together and not, not unlike what's happening here at Collins Cup you know yeah, yeah. so I, I I guess I'm thinking about that quite a bit right now because of uh, I feel like we're in a sort of similar moment of, in the sport. Oh, there are so many. There are really many. What I, what I very much like about was my, all my victories, of course, but certainly that first victory in Hawaii, that feeling was so intense, just, just standing there at the finish line and having my arms spread open. And I know I was so happy. I almost get tears te yeah. by telling it. I was so happy. I wanted to share that happiness with the whole world. That, that feeling was so intense, not just because of the victory, it was just that happiness. And it was so, so big that I, I thought I make the whole world happy. It was just not something for me, it was something that I wanted to share. I feel like I want to give you a hug, yeah, it's so it, passionate. It's, 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 it's really, it's, it's that power that, that, that brought me over, yeah. over my injury, you know? Yeah. When, they, when they said to me, I never will be able to get up my hands or to swim again, I said, no, I, I, I want to have that feeling back, and yeah. Amazing. Most memorable uh, moment, I would say uh, riding with my friends, big, big, big rides where we were laughing and crying sometimes, where we had the law 30k, I can remember one in Lanzarote, a big ride where we had the headwind in the end, going back to the... To Always in Lanzarote. Yeah, horrible, but best memories and the best laughs uh, when we had dinner. Go. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the little moments that happened when that nobody else saw. Um, one of them was with, so Jan in 2008, we have our battle, finishes, and then the two days later I'm wandering around the Olympic Village just trying to find a spot to just sit down and take it all in, and I go down into the basement of the cafeteria, I go into the back, I pull open this curtain thinking there's no one in there, and there's Jan just sitting there, he's got nothing, he's just sitting going like, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, mate. And he's like, no, come sit. And that little moment, we just got to sit and like talk about life and what's next. No and, and I had another one with him the other day. We we're here and all the stuff, triathlon aside, we talk about family and life. And those are special moments I will never forget. Yeah. Wow, that's really good to hear. Um, and then also, um, if, for our viewers here now, it, if you could give one tip for their triathlon training, racing, what would it be? I'm big on this narrative piece. It's how we speak to ourselves. Um, we, it gets caught up in the self-help kind of genre, but you watch in that press conference, you see Lionel, go look through the press conference and watch Lionel Sanders' body language. And the narrative of which obviously he is reinforcing to himself, that was a lesson in, that was quite something. And so that little piece there, you know, you, as is I think I am. And if you're gonna talk yourself out of things, you're, you're gonna be right. And if you're gonna talk yourself into things, you're gonna be right. Um, that little piece there trumps all the other things. It's like, propriety of breath is everything and how we speak to ourselves is, the key to that. So that little bit there, there you go. That's all I got. You got to be patient. 
You know, great gains don't happen overnight, they take place over years. And it's important also to honor your body, to, you know, test yourself, push yourself, challenge yourself, but at the same time to recover. There's a lot of athletes that I race against who didn't do that and they have paid the price of it. And so, you know, being great is like this thing of patience. It's uh, honoring your body and um, it's also just really getting enjoyment and fulfillment out of those simple small gains that you make in your, tr in your training that are real personal because if all you're in it for is to win a race, you know, one person's gonna win the friggin' race and everybody else, are they losers? No, you know? And, and so for me, I, the training was so satisfying, you know, cause I could just see myself, oh, I got a little better in the water, a little better on, on the track. And you know, those gains didn't come every day. They came maybe once a month or once every two months, but I was patient when those came, then it was like, that was cool. Mm. Look what I did today. And then I took that, those, moments and like stuck them all in there and then pulled them out when I needed them in the race. Like, okay, yeah, remember you just did that like last month, you can do this. Sprint the transitions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it's, uh, yeah, just to take a, a step back and have some perspective, like people, they get so wrapped up in, in the moment and um, feeling like, you know, the pressure is on and everything. and. You know, my best races were sort of when I learned to take the pressure off a little bit and just um, do it for the joy and for the fun. And um, and it's hard; it's not easy to do because mm -hmm. you know the pressure can be feel very real. Um, but ultimately, um, most of people are in this kind of it's self-driven, you know. And so all the pressure is actually self-imposed. And if you can kind of recognize that and uh, just make a deal with yourself that. You know, if you if you always give it your best effort, then you should be pleased with your result um, because that's really the one thing you can control. You better choose a easier sport. <laughs> 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 no, no, just have fun and, and don't, you know, everything is now so technical and GPS and what wattage systems and, and compression boots and everything. In the end, you just have to swim, bike, run and have fun. and. Uh, for us, it's our job, or it was my job. To we needed every percentage, but in the end, it's 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 a hobby. It's it's just fun and uh, so time-consuming. And uh, yeah, look at your family, your friends, your yeah yeah your, your private space, and uh, just have fun. Yeah. Enjoy what you're doing. This race is unique. You never get it back. It's just a moment. So live the moment. Enjoy it. Give your best every step, every stroke that you do and uh, yeah it's going to be magic it's really for me i think it's it's a turn or a point a remarkable point in the history of the sport we haven't seen that before and so it's long due and what's coming up here is the collins cup it's just yeah we will we will be impressed about that looking back in 20 years from now i think um if you, if you, first of all, you need to love what you do. It's the journey who counts. Of course, you have your goals, but always enjoy the journey. Uh, uh, have some friends around, maybe. I think uh, in the end, it's all, uh, you know, you want to remember the good times and, and the, the race is the icing on the cake. And uh, yeah, if I look back, the racing, the wins are great, but my memories are with my friends riding and uh, that, that's what counts. I love that. No. Remember, the, this is a, triathlon's a catered workout. Right? It's not about uh, winning anything, and it's, it's great if you do, but it's, it's a lifetime sport. It's something that you want to enjoy forever because at the end of the day, it's, it's swim, bike, and run. Anybody can do it, and you're going to change your life for the better. It's going to make you a better employer, better employee, better family member, better father, daughter, son. It's, it's one of those things that, that people underestimate the power of sport, and especially our sport. Triathlon is, what I love about it for the hyperactive people out there like me, is you start and you jump in the water and you're going, this is great, I love this, I'm getting bored, oh, I'm out of the water. <laughs> and then you get on the bike and you're like, this is awesome, I'm liking it, oh, my neck is sore, my shoulders are sore, I'm done. <laughs> and then you get in the run and you're thinking the same thing. This is, this is my, and triathlon's a little different because you start out going, oh, my legs are heavy and then you start feeling good. My legs feel great, this is fun. And then you go, oh my God, this is taking forever. When's this gonna be over? And then it's over and you're in a beer garden. And I've, over the years, I've moved from long distance racing 
to sprint races because there's nothing better in the world than being in a beer garden at nine o'clock in the morning with your best friends. After completing something that you know that most people 9 a.m., they're not even up yet, and you're in a beer garden with your best buds. So that, that love our sport because it's the best sport on the planet. Amen to that.